Okay, hello YouTube. Um, today we're going to go over another Paul Morphy game. Uh, this is going to be Alexander Meek versus Paul Morphy. It was played in uh, Mobile in 1855. And one of the cool things about this game is you get a chance to see how Paul Morphy handled the black pieces. Um, a lot of people know that Paul Morphy was always up on tempo when he played chess. Um, it always seemed like he was ahead on time. And this wasn't just because, you know, he had you know, more moves to play with. Obviously, if you play white, you're going to be up a, a half a move to start with. So this was because Morphy just understood tempo. He understood how to gain it, and he understood how to lose it. He understood when he was wasting time. One of the things I like about this particular game is in this game, uh, he managed to, to get up tempo um, just not by doing anything special. He actually just managed to get up tempo just by, just by utilizing his moves properly. His opponent really tries to attack him kind of like a beginner. And Morphe just, just just defends, and then he ends up up-tempo, and um, it was really nothing that he did. Um, it was just, just playing chess really, really well in open positions, which is what Morphe did. So I, I, just, I just think this game is really instructive, and, and also if somebody tries to do like a beginner attack against you in the opening, this really shows you how to, how to parry that attack, because this question gets asked a lot. How do I parry these, these beginner two-piece attacks? How, how do I deal with them? So... This game starts out e4, e5. So e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6. We have d4, c takes, e takes d4. This is usually the best way to handle a uh, primary pawn break in the middle of the board. Nine times out of ten, the best thing to do is to take it. So that's just a little pro tip. So e takes d4, bishop c4. So this is called, um, it's like the scotch gambit. Or this can come out of the Italian game too, uh, where you play d4. So then we have bishop c5, which is uh, one of the better moves here. You just develop a piece, um, you hold your center pawn, and, and then there's a lot of different ways that, that white can continue here. White can um, castle kingside is really popular, uh, and then, you know, there's other moves that, that white can try. If white wants to try, like, a pure gambit, he can play a move like c3. What Meek does here, I, I wouldn't recommend it. This is kind of like what I was talking about. It's a two-piece attack. He's just kind of attacking Morphe, kind of like a beginner. He plays the move knight g5. And... You see kids do this a lot. They, they play knight g5 because they're trying to get this fork. And then you always get the question, like, like what, what do I do when they play knight g5? Well, if you've already got your knight and bishop out, you would just castle and just defend it with your rook. And you would gain tempo that way. In the two knights defense, when you only have your knight out and your bishop is back here, you end up having to play d5 to parry this attack. And in this case, Morphe parries the attack by moving his knight. Um... Not this one, the one he hasn't moved yet. He plays knight h6. And this is really critical. Morphy really understood tempo. He understood that you wanted to try to get a piece out of every single move. Now, a lot of kids, they don't like to make a move like this. They don't like to play knight h6 because people tell them, and they say, oh, well, knights on the rim are dim. Yeah, but again, it's a question of tempo. Okay, you, uh, and Another example of, you know, moving a piece to the rim is I mentioned like the two move checkmate, you know, after the moves, you know, the first move F3, E5, G4, you know, Queen H4, mate, I mean, by opening standards, isn't a very good move. You moved your queen out too early, you moved it to the edge of the board, but guess what? That's checkmate. That ends the game. So a lot of times in chess, because of tactical considerations, we have to make moves that don't necessarily follow the opening principles. In this case, the pawn was getting attacked twice. Not only that, white broke opening principles. White moved his knight twice, and white put his knight on the edge of the board. Okay, so of course, he spent two moves to get this knight to g4, g5. You can spend one move to get your knight to h6. And now your knight is developed. It's out. It's not on an ideal square, but it's out. You have three pieces out, and he has two. Somehow, Morphe is already up-tempo in this game. Okay, so now that we've discussed the tempo ramifications. Let's take a look and see what Meek did next. Now this is really interesting. He plays this tactical move. He plays knight takes f7. And this is just kind of how they played chess back then. They, they liked to get these one and two piece attacks and just attack with stuff. And even though this does actually sort of win a pawn, he just gets rid of all of his developed pieces. Look at all this energy he spent. One, two, three, and then this bishop is going to go one, two. It's five tempos down the drain. Um, just to do what? Because he gets the f-pawn, but black still has an extra pawn on d4, so he just basically got his pawn back. All that tempo wasted. 
So then knight takes f7, bishop takes f7, king takes f7, queen h5 check. This is the idea. He gets the piece back. It's a fork. He's attacking the king. He's attacking the bishop. So he didn't actually lose a piece. So it, in that way, he was being clever. And then this is a move I want to mention. Morphy has a choice now of, of where to move his king. And he chooses not to move his king. And the reason is because this rook on h8 needs a way to develop you know, and Morphy was always thinking about this when he made moves. He was always thinking about how do I finish my development, you know, long run. You know, how am I going to get all my pieces out? So even in just little situations like this where he's trying to consider how to get out of check, he's thinking, how am I going to finish my development? What's the easiest way to get my rook into the game down the road? What's the easiest way to get my bishop into the game down the road? My queen, my other rook. He was very good at this. He, he was always thinking, how am I going to get all my pieces out? And he was always coming up with a plan for that. So he did not want to move his king back to f8, g8, e, or, or you know e7, whatever, because he didn't want this rook to get blocked. So he's not going to move back to any either of these two highlighted squares. And by playing g6, he gives his king another square that it can run to that's not blocking the rook. So he's thinking about this. He's always thinking about this. And everyone needs to think about this in their games. You know, they need to think about long term. How am I going to develop my pieces? Okay, so just queen takes c5. And again, d6, tempo gain on the queen, preparing to develop this bishop. Okay, so then we have queen b5. And... Morphy just develops another piece and creates a pin. Rook e8, great move, just creating this pin. So now queen b3 check, and here's why that pin's important. Check out this move. d5. He just blocks that check. And then guess what? We don't have anything down the pipe here because of this nice little pin that we have against the king. And there's nothing going on. It looks like there should be something going on, but guess what? Nothing going on there. Okay, so then f3. And then we have the move knight a5. And this is just really simple. You know, Morphy wants to complete his development by taking here. And he wants to complete his development um, by developing this piece, developing his queen. All he has to do is just get this queen off of this diagonal, because here's the pin too. So this is the thing, is Morphy likes pinning his opponents because he gets to gain time. He doesn't like it when his opponents are pinning him. And as soon as his opponents start pinning him, he'll, he'll find a way to break that pin. So he has no problem pinning his opponents, doesn't like getting pinned, so he'll break those pins immediately. Queen d3, and then we have he takes on e4, f takes e4, and then great move here, fork, queen h4 check. And then that's a fork, that's hitting the king, and that's hitting the pawn. And here in one move, this is rare for Morphe, Morphe actually makes a, a mistake. Um, after the move g3, the best move is queen takes e4. And this is I say this is really rare. Morphe was one of the most accurate players in history. Like, he hardly ever made any errors. Um, but I have noticed that when he did make errors, he was usually already he was usually already winning. Um, you know, some of his bigger errors, he was usually already winning the game. Uh, but he made he made very few errors, and he's he's actually probably still winning uh with the move he played, although there wasn't there was a weird opportunity for uh for for white to get back into it and i'm going to show that here and it was really hard to see it's really hard for anyone to see actually uh but in the game he played the move rook takes e4 and we're going to go over that in a second but he had this possibility he could have played queen takes e4 this would have been very easily winning the game um a sample variation would have been queen takes e4 rook takes e4 now the downside here is the queens do come off the board uh and that's probably why morphe dismissed this but i would point out uh, Morphe is just up a pawn right here after bishop g4. You'll notice Morphe has, you know, uh, six pawns. His opponent only has five. Also, the development situation is not very good. All of White's pieces are on their original square except for the king. The only piece you don't want on its original square, the king, is is the only piece that White has developed. Um, this is not good. And and even though queens are off the board. Black has plenty of pieces to do some serious damage here. This attack is by no means over. Um, just a little sample line uh, with, with you know, potentially best play here from white, which this is still really nasty. It would be something like rook f1, just trying to castle by hand, just get that king safe. The king safety is actually more important than the development right now. This king's in a lot of trouble. Rook e2, king g1, and then you would just play something like, uh, well, this is check. Notice that's a discover check. 
So you'd have to play a king move, king g7, and then bishop f4, and now bishop h3 hitting this rook with tempo. Rook d1, rook g2 check, just trying to get this king to pick where it wants to go. Obviously, if it goes to f1, we're going to have discoveries along here. So like king f1, and we're lining up with this, which would mean that we can move this rook away to either here, here, just anywhere, someplace fun. And we're going to do some serious damage. Just, just you know, take your take your pick. One of these one of these squares is going to do some damage. I'd probably just take the pawn on on c2 to be totally honest. Um, I don't think that pawn on h2 is going anywhere. So all those possibilities would be good. So king h1 is is kind of forced, and then you'd just bring your other rook into the game with rook e8. And with that rook coming down to e2, this is going to be over. Um, rook e2 would actually threaten uh, mate in three. You'd actually threaten to bring this rook to h2, this rook to g2, and when that rook gets to g2, it's held by the bishop. And then it's just a question of sliding the other rook down to h1 with mate. So this would have been huge, um, and this would have been a quick win for Morphe, an easy way to win. Now, the game that was played in the game, Morphe ended up winning quickly anyway. Um, he played rook takes e4, and this is kind of just how Morphe played chess. He liked to keep queens on the board, and if he didn't see a reason why the queens could come off the board, he would... He would leave them on, but White had a really weird possibility, and I don't blame Morphe for not finding it, because it's really weird. I mean, it's strange. I don't blame either player for not finding it, but in the game, White played the logical-looking move King F2, and then Morphe didn't have much trouble finishing off this game, and I'll show you how. But there was this cool possibility, um, and just always look for defensive resources right, like this. Like, just remember, usually, uh, you know, you look at your capture. Can you capture the piece that's checking you? And then you look at all, you look, if you can block, it's capture, block, and then move your king. So could Morphe have blocked the check? And the answer is yes. Now, it looks silly when you look at it, but you got to remember, this queen's hanging too. And it looks really silly because you're you're walking into a pin. Like, how could this be right? You know, but here's a resource that I think both players overlooked was after, say, the queen moves, because rook takes doesn't work because just queen takes the rook, pawn takes, and then you take the queen. That's up in exchange. So the queen's going to move, right? So where's the only logical place for this queen to move? Okay, queen e7. And this is the resource that I think they both overlooked. You can simultaneously get out of the pin and gain a tempo. This would have been a move right up Morphe's alley. Castle's kingside check. So I think they both overlooked that, that this was possible. So that that would have been really cool. And it would have saved White. White's actually doing okay here. He he survives. Not only does he survive, um, he, he probably has an equal position now. Uh, just, just incredible. It just went from totally losing to equality so quickly. After bishop f5, bishop g5, and um, again, a cute tactic here. This bishop g5 move would be another exclamation mark move. The bishop can't be captured because of this pin. Look at all these pins all over the place. Morphe had a lot of pins in his game. Bishop g5, queen takes e4. So then he would gain another tempo with bishop g5. And the queen would have to stay on the e-file so we don't lose the rook. And then we can finish our development with knight d2. And amazingly, white is doing just fine because now it's black's pieces that are a little bit awkward for the material. So that would have been just an amazing game-saving move. Uh, blocking with the bishop. <laughs> just... I still I, I still kind of smile a little bit when I look at this move. I mean, this move is crazy. Blocking with the bishop and putting it in a pin where it's already being attacked by a pawn. Yes, that is the right move. And that's why you don't dismiss anything when you're calculating. You look at your checks, your captures, your threats. And when you look at getting out of check, you look at capturing the piece that's checking you, no matter how ridiculous it looks. And, you know, I went over a, you know... Slaying the dragon or not, I went over a Fisher game where Fisher missed such a move in his analysis as well, where he simply, where his opponent could have captured the piece that was checking him, and that would have been very good. And this is a move that Morphe missed, where where his opponent could have blocked in the most crazy way and still, you know, managed to save the game. So just kind of a cool move. So Queen e7, and then White tries to finish his development with the move. Okay, so yeah, the game the game continued with. Uh, like I said, the game did not continue with queen e3. The game continued with king f2, and then queen e7, and then white tried to finish his development with the move knight to d2. And that, that ended up just being a mistake, because black has a huge attack against the king. So rook e3 hitting the queen, and, and more importantly, choking off the oxygen here. Queen b5, and then c6. This is a brutal move. He's just trying to get the queen off of this diagonal. 
if he can get the queen off of this diagonal, which the knight is effectively controlling, he's going to be able to play rook e2 and pretty much end the game. So queen f1, and then just brutal move after brutal move here. Again, just trying to get the queen off of e2. Bam! With tempo, getting the queen off of e2, sacrificing the bishop. <sighs> Morphy was so good in open positions. I mean, just so good. So he didn't even take it. If if you take it, it's it's actually over. After rook e2, like let's say the king goes up, like king f3. Uh if the king goes back, it's 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 even worse. Like king back, rook e1 check, king f2, queen, queen e2 is just made. That's really fast. So king f3, queen e3 check, king g4, and then simply h5. Now the best here objectively is to sacrifice your queen. Remember, take the piece that's checking you. You have to survive a little bit longer. Queen takes pawn, king takes, king takes, but after the only real move that anybody would play, king h4, queen e7 is made. Okay, so after bishop h3, which happened in the game, white just, he's like, no, I'm going to stay on, I'm staying on e2. <laughs> I'm not giving up. Okay, but rick f8, last piece gets into the game with tempo, aimed against the king. Now, this is a lot of artillery aimed at that king. This is going to be over. Knight f3, and then simply king e8. Um, developing that last rook. Remember, by definition, development, a piece that can get from one side of the board to the other. That rook on f8 is now officially developed. And black, and, and, and black won this game. White resigned. Um, rook uh, takes f3 is not a stoppable threat. Uh, it, you, could, you could take the rook on e3, you know, but then just simply queen takes e3. And um, that's mate. <laughs> so that would have been the end of the game. So it wasn't uh, uh, too far off anyway. So that was another great Morphe game. Morphe again shows us how to play open positions. He shows us, he shows us how to handle the two-piece attack. You know, that was really what this game was. It shows you how to handle that two-piece attack. And, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, just shows you Morphe was just as deadly with the black pieces as he was with the white pieces. I hope you learned something from this game. Thank you very much for watching.